Hi, welcome to Family Affairs. I'm Lisa Kimura, I'm your host, here live from the Think Tech Hawaii studios. Brought to you today with information on, uh, from our providers on mental health. I'd like to welcome today Jess Logan and Rachel Ebert to talk about the things that moms are really going through. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for being for here. Um, so I'd like to know, please tell me a little bit more about what it's like, what m women are really going through after they've given birth. What is it like for them to get the experience? Well, it can definitely be very overwhelming, um, especially for first-time moms. It's just kind of no matter how much preparation you do, there are always surprises, always things that are unexpected and can be really challenging. So what kinds of challenges do they necessarily have, or what kinds of things do people experience that they weren't really expecting? I think it's just it's a combination of things. It's that feeling of almost sometimes moms feel a little bit lost, like they've lost a lot of things. They've lost their their time to themselves, they've lost their previous identity, which may have been uh, as a professional or just as just a wife or, um, you know, a lot of different things. Their time with their friends, they've kind of had that loss, but then they also have these mixed feelings of, um, you know, maybe anxiety about their baby, maybe they're not doing it right. A lot of moms get this horrible guilt of maybe I don't love my baby enough, maybe I'm not really cut out to be a mom. And a lot of those feelings can just be extremely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think also these days there's so much information out there online and so many different opinions and you hear from all these different people about what you should be doing and where your baby should be at. So I think that also can add to some of the stress is that, oh, well, if I'm not doing it the way that my auntie's doing it or that, you know, this online forum says it should be going, then maybe I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you get involved working with moms? What was, what was it that interested you about this field? Um, I really enjoy working with moms. I think that it started for me um, when I was just practicing therapy in general, and I took note of who the clients were that I connected with a little bit more. Um, and so I really enjoyed working with children and also working with their parents, and that kind of just developed into maternal mental health for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I had my own child, it was a big eye-opener as far as how challenging it can be and how different it is than what I expected, even as someone who kind of had the training mm -hmm. in the field. How about you, Rachel? Yeah, so I have worked with moms in different capacities for a long time. I was a preschool teacher, and then prior, um, I worked in early intervention, so with moms um, whose babies were struggling with um, developmental delays. And it wasn't until after I had my child that I was just overwhelmed by how difficult it was. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like Jess kind of said, like, I thought I had it all together. I had so much knowledge. I had been focused on early childhood for so long, and especially birth to three. And then it was just kind of shocking to me how challenging it was for me to go through that. And it made me want to help other moms to prepare for that time and then to, to get through it. Was there any kind of experience that you had yourself that really stuck out that made you maybe change your opinion about the access for moms or the support that moms need or, or anything like that that was really life-changing for you? I mean, I had a, several experiences that I thought were, you know, I was disappointed in the system um, where, you know, I had um, had an experience in, before I had my daughter where I had a miscarriage. I went to the doctor. That whole process was not very, um, Mater like mental health friendly, I guess. I had checked a box saying that I had been really sad for several days. No one ever really asked. Mm -hmm. No one gave me any support. Um, and then even postpartum, I didn't feel like, I don't know if I ever filled out any screenings, if I was ever asked, you know, how are you doing? Right. <laughs> As opposed to how's baby, you know, how's your body, but never really like, how are you? How are you doing inside? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about for you? Yeah, I think that I did have um, some good experiences with mom groups, and so I think that that brought me a lot of support at the time, and that was one positive that I hadn't really expected. I didn't think that having friends with kids or without kids, mom friends, would make a difference, but it actually did really bring me some comfort, so that was a big help for me. Yeah, I think that the, I mean, the mom groups are huge, and having that support, um, my biggest problem was that my daughter didn't like being in the car, Mm -hmm. um, I had postpartum anxiety, you know, a milder form of it, and so I didn't, you know, it was really hard for me to get out of the house. So as much as I craved being at mom groups, I just 
struggled to do it, mm -hmm. to go to them. So that was one of the harder parts of that because I knew that I needed more mom friends. Um, none of our friends that lived here previously had children, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew I needed it. I just didn't, I just struggled to get it. Mm -hmm. I think it took a while. Yeah, it's really isolating as a new yeah. parent, for sure. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you see? You both work with moms, and you both have maternal mental health practices. Um, what kinds of things do you see typically with them, or what are the common challenges that they have? Guilt is a big one. I think a lot of new moms feel guilty that they aren't, um, doing enough, they're not, they're not doing enough for themselves, not doing enough for the baby, not doing enough for their partners. Um, if they're going back to work, not doing enough at their job. Um, so there's always this feeling of, of kind of lacking somehow or not being as good as they used to or as good as they should be. Um, occasionally there are also feelings of shame, of feeling like, you know, this is embarrassing, I'm supposed to be so happy and joyous and this is supposed to be wonderful, but I don't really feel that way and there's a lot of embarrassment that comes with that. Um, wanna take yeah, I think just, you know, and then all the other things that we know, you know, the, the lack of sleep and the lack of time alone and all of that. And I think moms get so caught up in trying to do it all and being the perfect mom. And, you know, I don't have time to take care of me. I hear that all the time. And right. I felt that way, too. Like, I just don't have time. Um, but just, you know, how important it is that we cannot run on an empty tank. Like we just, yeah. we can't, we keep trying and I see moms trying all the time, but it just doesn't, it doesn't really work. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's that kind of mythical gold standard about work-life balance and a, you know, well-rounded, perfect mom, but that is not true. And right. really the attainment of work-life balance is kind of almost I mean, you can try to attain it, but it's really, really tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you, can you explain to me a little bit more about kind of the degrees of um, mental health suffering or depression or what kinds of things, you know, would moms be able to experience as a range of symptoms after giving birth? Um, so in the first, in the beginning, certainly people are going to be emotional. They're going to be exhausted. They're going to be tearful. Um, and this, you know, again, none of this is everybody, but... That does happen pretty common for a lot of women in the first two weeks, I would say. Um, it's just from being so overwhelmed, having something new happening, it can be hormonal, it can be a lot of different factors that are contributing to the way that you feel because of those changes in the first two weeks. Um, it can also be something that causes anxiety and stress where you're constantly watching the baby, not wanting to leave the baby. Um, if these things continue past the two-week mark, that's usually around when we would say it might be more than just the baby blues, what people talk about as baby blues, um, and that it could be moving more into something like postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression, um, or a different kind of adjustment that might need a little assistance. What kinds of things do people experience, or how would they know that they're having postpartum depression or anxiety? What does that look like? I think, I mean, it looks different for every mom, and that's, you know, and it's hard to see, especially from the outside, you know, from, usually partners can see it. A lot of times mom will still come in and say, I just don't feel like myself. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll be feeling, you know, having trouble sleeping, even though they're exhausted. You know, things like just that extreme feelings of anxiety of not wanting to leave the home or um, not wanting to leave baby with anyone, being really nervous about what baby, you know, if other people are holding baby. Um, also can be intrusive thoughts. And so intrusive thoughts can be really scary for moms. And they can be um, really hard to tell anyone about because they're so, they're frightened of them themselves. So those can look like thoughts of like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I can't, I'm going to drop my baby down the stairs and just imagining what, how horrible that would be or that, you know, my baby's going to stop breathing or, um, you know, that as I'm driving, I might swerve and something would happen. And so these thoughts are, like I said, usually scary for moms. And, and that's their way of knowing that, um, that they're, you know, that there are intrusive thoughts. Um, and I think that um, for a lot of moms, like I said, they're just scared to share this with anyone because they do seem so frightening. Mm -hmm. and probably yeah. fears of getting their babies taken away yeah. or right. things like that. Do you find that people tend to hide their feelings for a while? Or is it something that, I mean, stigmatization is really, really big for mental health in general. Right. What do you find in particular when it comes to moms? How, how willing are they to seek help or to, to suggest that they might need some help? Yeah, I definitely think there is a stigma out there against asking for help um, because you are supposed to 
kind of have it all down and be able to manage this, and it's um, supposed to be just come naturally. So I do think that that is difficult. I think a lot of people do wait a long time before they reach out. And one of the things that I try to encourage in, in pregnancy is just being open to the idea that even if you're just kind of uncomfortable, why suffer? Um, you don't have to necessarily diagnose yourself as being clinically depressed to reach out for help. Sometimes it's just like Rachel said, I don't really feel like myself and I want to be you know, more comfortable in my day-to-day -day life. And that's just as good a reason to reach out. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that unfortunately sometimes happens is people might reach out and then not get much of a response. So, mm -hmm. you know, even telling your partner, like, I really am not feeling okay. Um, you know, and them saying, you know, maybe you just need a nap. Mm -hmm. or just get some rest and you'll feel better. And, you know, it's, I think it's hard for moms to keep reaching out, right? That they feel like they keep having to try. Um, and even with their doctors might say, you know, just give it a couple weeks, maybe you'll feel better. But I think we'd both say encourage moms to, to get the support and try and make changes um, to start feeling better. Mm -hmm. We've got some photos of babies, you know, and moms in the postpartum period and moms that are meeting with groups of friends or things like that to try to get that support. But where would you suggest someone starts or how would they even know that they need to start looking for some extra help? I go for it. Yeah. So I think. Um, how you would know that you want to get extra help is just if you're not happy with the way things are going in your life day to day. I would say it's that simple. It doesn't need to be much more extreme than that. Um, where you can look, there are certainly a number of therapists out there who are focused on maternal mental health in the Hawaii area um, who can be very helpful. There's uh, organizations such as uh, Postpartum Support International that has call lines. Um, there is also a local Postpartum Support International coordinator, Diane Ashton, who runs a support group. Um, in addition, there's just mom social groups like uh, Pico Pals and Family Hui and a lot of Facebook groups. You know, there's really a mom and Kiki group for almost anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So whatever your interests are, if you look out there, there's often a place to get at least the social support and then also the mental health support as you need it. And we'll put up on the screen, too, as well, some of those calls, you know, how people can reach out and find that support. Um, but, you know, say that after someone's just given birth, at what point would someone expect to possibly develop a problem? Or would this even happen during pregnancy? Yeah, it definitely can start during pregnancy. Some women start to experience um, some of the anxiety, even some of the intrusive thoughts can occur then. Um, you know, I think that I've been working with pregnant moms a lot more lately, and I really enjoy that because it's the prevention piece, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I find that if women have a history of any mental health issues, if they have, um, you know, there's there's a whole, like, list of risk factors that I think will we'll show at some point. Um, if you have those risk factors, it's, it doesn't hurt to get some support, right? And to work on planning for postpartum and preparing for it. Because the more you're prepared and the more you're informed, then you kind of know what to look out for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, symptoms can start, like Jess was saying, with baby blues just after you've had baby. But then it's kind of figuring out if that goes away um, and, and how to manage it at that point. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about those symptoms and what to expect right after this break. Please come back. I'm Lisa Kimura, host of Family Affairs. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show, and it's streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back to Family Affairs. I'm Lisa Kimura. 
Here with me today, Jess Logan and I'm Rachel Ebert, uh, experts in maternal mental health, and I'm here to talk a little bit more about what to look for when it comes to moms that may figure out that <clears throat> something's not right for them, that they don't feel right, things are not how they should be, they don't feel like themselves. Well, you know, sometimes people don't really know, probably, what they're experiencing or what they should be experiencing or what to look for. A lot of times the media kind of dictates, you know, what people's understanding of postpartum depression even is. Can you talk a little bit about what those symptoms are and, and really how it differs from what people's expectations are? Yeah, and I think like we had sort of talked about, it's looking at that, um, you know, that feeling of just not feeling right and that a lot of moms describe when they come in and they say, you know, I just didn't feel quite like myself. Um, and then, you know, I always like to think about what it might look like from a partner's perspective or an outsider's perspective. You know, someone that's close to the mom might also be noticing like that she's not sleeping well. She's maybe, the other thing that happens a lot is anger. Mm -hmm. Some of it comes out as anger, the lack of sleep, those feelings of guilt, all of that can kind of bubble up into looking like anger. Um, so the, the partner might see some of those things and those different symptoms. But you know, it's interesting because society might not see it at all. Mom might look pretty much like she's got it together. She might show up at mommy groups with a smile, with her lipstick on, her hair done, looking like she has everything together. Um, or she might not. <laughs> so, um, but moms sometimes can really hide it well. That's part of, you know, a lot of times moms are good at faking it um, just to get through the day. But, you know, we never know how long it took her to get the motivation to get out of the house mm -hmm. or how many times she canceled before she actually decided to go. Sometimes it can be um, changes in your appetite or changes in your weight or changes in your sleep, um, feeling worried all the time, feeling kind of hopeless or worthless. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are degrees, certainly, of, of suffering that women experience. Um, what, tell me a little bit more about what it looks like for a mom who, well, okay, here's a better question, actually. What, what, how often can someone expect to have some sort of postpartum mood disorder? It's extremely common to have um, a postpartum mood and anxiety disorder. So they're looking at about 20% of moms. So that's one in five moms approximately is having some, some of these symptoms. Um, we can touch really briefly on the very rare postpartum psychosis, which is about one to two in a thousand moms experience. That's the one you kind of see a little bit more on the news. Um, and that is, like I said, much more rare. It usually happens within the first few days to the first week or two. Um, and it's very different than what we've been discussing. It's really um, when mom has had a psychotic break and she is not aware of what's going on. She's not aware of that something's wrong. This is usually when the partner might realize that something's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that one is, like I said, very rare. It's much more common for women to experience some of these other symptoms. So there's a recommendation that moms should be screened during pregnancy and after giving birth, but we know that's not routinely happening or it's not happening in the greatest way. Like you said, they may just kind of check the box and move on that something's wrong. How would someone really, where would you go after that if your doctor maybe doesn't take you seriously or doesn't know to take you seriously? How could you, how could you find other sources of support? I think Jess had touched on it a little bit. You can contact Postpartum Support International. They have a lot of resources, and through them, you could get to the information of Diane, who's the local support coordinator. She um, knows where all of us are on the island and kind of what insurance we take and um, you know where we're located and all that. Um, the other option is to call the Mother's Care Line. That's how you can reach Jess and I. Um, Mother's Care Line offers other information and services as well, um, information about services for moms. So that's a great way to get your questions answered. Right. As far as the treatment goes, I mean, some people may have a very, you know, misperception about what that looks like or that they need to take medication or things like that. Really, what does it look like for a mom who's going through some form of treatment? So it depends on what the mom is coming in for, but generally I would say there can be therapy alone, can be medication involved as well. It depends on kind of the severity and what the uh, person is open to. So there is sort of um, a thought that medication is not safe for pregnancy or for breastfeeding, but that's actually not really 
through in the research anymore. There are certainly a lot of medications that are safe, and so you would just need to talk with your prescribing provider about what would be okay to take. So I certainly wouldn't discourage that. But treatment in therapy, a lot of it is just kind of someone to be there and support and you know validate what you're going through, help to normalize some of the processes that you're experiencing, let you know what to look for that would not be normal that you might want to watch out for, things that you can do to feel better, things that you can do to feel better in the moment, things that you can feel do to feel better in the long term, um, you know, just little tips and strategies about changes you might make in the way that you're thinking or the things that you're doing that can lead to some better feelings. And what would be maybe one of those strategies that someone could incorporate to, to change those behaviors or patterns? Sure. Yeah, I would say definitely um, reaching out to some sort of social group is a big help. So having that, that kind of normalizes your experience in a lot of ways, seeing what other moms are going through. I also really love um, relaxation techniques. So taking some time, even just like five minutes of your day to do a breathing exercise or have a guided meditation. There's so many apps on phones that people can download these days. And I feel like that's a, a good yeah. way to take some time for self-care. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, I talk with my moms a lot about self-care and there's you know, self-care, we have this image of being at a spa or getting our nails mm -hmm. done that we that seems so unattainable when we have a newborn. Um, and that's not what I'm really talking about. Obviously, that's great if you can fit it in mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and should be if you can. But um, it's really just carving out those minutes during the day that you can do something. So for some moms, that something is just different. But, you know, helping moms to figure out what is that something that can help recharge you in 10 to 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And then where in your day can you find that 20 minutes? And it can be hard because you, you know, maybe when your partner's working, when they come home, you want to have family time or, you know, it's just gets it's hard to make time. But finding that little time in your day to take for yourself to fill you up, whatever it, it is, if it's you know, doing yoga or meditation or watching a silly show or whatever it is that kind of can help fill that cup for the day. How long would someone expect it would take until they feel better or back to themselves again? Yeah, that's a good question and a very common question. Usually people want to know right away, you know, when will this be over? And it can be really quick. I mean, it really can just be a couple of weeks. For other people, it takes longer and can be more like a couple of months. Um, so it, it does just depend. But the sooner that you get help and the more that you do, the more likely you are to feel better. And it kind of ebbs and flows, too. I think some moms will be like, I'm feeling so much better, and now I feel like I'm back into that rut again. And it just, it, it does take time. I mean, if for, like you said, you know, for some moms with milder symptoms, um, it can be pretty quick. But for some moms, it might take a while, and it can be, feel frustrating and overwhelming to feel that, you know, down for so long. Yeah. Have you ever had an experience with a patient or a client that, you know, was, did take a long time or was there additional supports that were needed or, or what, would some, what would it take for someone who was really persistently having trouble? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are some people who really struggle and um, depending on the level of severity, I mean, sometimes people will need to see a psychiatrist look into some medication options. Some people will need to be hospitalized if they're feeling like they're going to hurt themselves. Um, there are higher levels of care out there as needed. And maybe for a mom who had had her own history of mental health issues and maybe is very afraid about what's coming up, what kind of advice would you give to a mom like that? I mean, working with moms in pregnancy, I think, is doing a lot of postpartum planning and getting a lot of supports in place. Um, you know, it's no one can explain quite how hard it is to have a newborn and to feed yourself and, and get keep everything together. So just making sure that um, they have a pretty good support system available um, to, to help them during that initial postpartum time to get them through at least that part. Um, and then, yeah, working on different, some of those relaxation strategies and a lot of, I like to do a lot of psychoeducation so that them and the partner is aware of what to expect and what to look out for. We just had a, a list up there on the screen that was talking about things to look for. And one of them was just a lack of interest in family or a lack of interest in your baby. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that just describes the feeling of, you know, things that used to bring me happiness are no longer bringing me happiness. Mm. So I used to love getting out and taking walks, and now I can't get off the couch. Or I used to really enjoy, you know, dinner with my family, and now I don't even want to go. 
Um, so those kinds of things where you feel like lack of motivation, low energy, and things that used to make you happy don't really make you happy anymore. Mm -hmm. Those are also some signs to watch for. I think a lot of moms too have this image of like that they're, this baby's gonna be born and they're gonna be so in love and it's gonna be perfect and this fairy tale idea. And if they don't quite feel that, that intense feeling of love, then they feel a lot of guilt because of that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it does take mom's time to feel that love. I mean, it's a new person, they don't know them. Right. So um, it's not this like fairy tale always for moms that baby comes out. And especially for moms that have maybe struggled with their in, with infertility, or maybe had um, you know a challenging birth experience, all those things can factor into a lot of feelings of sadness and guilt. Yeah, I remember with my own first birth that it was very traumatic and very unexpected, where everything went wrong, and and the bonding didn't happen right away. Like I thought, you know, culturally, this myth that you know you're just going to fall in love and everything's perfect. Um, how about for yourselves? Was there anything in your own personal lives that, that made you really, you know, feel like this is something you wanted to help other women with? Yeah, I think for me it was just the shock of not really knowing what I was doing and had, you know, naively thought that because I had worked in this field that I would have an edge up, which, you know, it's still really overwhelming. It's mm -hmm. overwhelming for anyone. And mm -hmm. I think that that was um, what really stuck out for me. Yeah, and I always go to this idea, like I had mentioned, it was kind of hard to find mom groups, and then I would find mom groups, but I wouldn't find like a friend, like mm -hmm. one that I really connected with. And so I finally did start to find friends at like eight to ten months, my daughter was postpartum, and it was like, if we'd have just met when we were pregnant, like how much nicer this would have been, and how much easier it would have been if we'd have connected, like then it would have just made the whole process so much easier. So it made me really passionate about, you know, trying to get moms connected during pregnancy or as soon as baby's born um, with programs like Pico Pals and stuff like that. Absolutely. I'm going to put a number or a website up on the screen right now which will help people if they are looking, whether it's looking for support, looking for reaching you ladies to get help with their mental health or for anything else. Um, HMHB-Hawaii.org is Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies organization and the Mothers Caroline is part of that as well. Um, but we are just about out of time for today, so I want to thank you very much for being here. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with everyone, and hopefully it'll be supportive for other moms that are experiencing this. Yeah. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Lisa Kimura, host of Family Affairs. Join us next time at the Think Tech Hawaii Studios. Aloha.